This video is to all the Christians who are struggle, all the born again Christians who are struggling with um, gay desires, and and anybody who's not saved, who's not born again, and is gay, who's living the gay lifestyle but wants out. Um, to the people that that are not saved and want out of the gay lifestyle, um, Jesus is the only way. He's it. Um, you're not going to be able to get out on your own. You're not going to be able to stop those desires on your own. It's not going to happen through therapy or, um, you know, just deciding, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Um, because it, it, it's, it's bondage. You're in bondage to that sin. Um, and Jesus is the only way to, to get out of that, to be delivered from that bondage. Um, and that, that just means accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and which means he becomes your boss when he's your Lord man he's your boss he's your master and he tells you what to do and you live your life the way that he wants you to live it um, <clears throat> his will is not for you to live a gay lifestyle that I can guarantee you um, he has a much better plan for your life and so if if you if you're gay and you want out of that, Jesus is the only way, um, and I'm living proof of that. Um, you know, I was gay for 14 years, and I didn't get saved because I was because I was gay and I wanted out. It's not why I got saved. There were other other things that that led me to that, but. The minute I got saved, the minute I, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, that moment. I know now that it was the Holy Spirit, but at the time, I just knew in my heart, at that second, that the, the gay lifestyle that I had been living was over, for 14 years was over. It, it ended at that second. Not that I didn't have the desires still, because I did. And, 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 but at that moment, you know, I, I knew it was over, and, and I knew I couldn't do it on my own. And I remember telling Jesus, I said, I said, Jesus, okay, it's over. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm done. But I can't do it on my own. I said, you got to take it from me. Um, and he did. He was faithful to do that. And it was hard, man. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy road. It, and it does, didn't happen overnight. didn't happen in a week. It didn't happen in a month. It took six months for me. Um... And, it, you know, it took me crying out and crying out all the time to God, you know, and and holding up my end of the bargain, you know, which was being obedient to him and, and asking for strength to resist Satan, you know, because it would have been really easy just to give in, you know, but my, my, my heart was for Jesus and what he wanted for me, for my life. And so I wasn't going to give in. And um, it took a, a lot of crying out to God, man, <laughs> a lot. And I, I can get into details about that in another video, but... I mean, I quit hanging around the, the, the friends that I had, um, and I prayed to God a, a lot to give me Christian friends. You know, Christian female friends that, that I could, you know, be encouraged by and, and hang out with and just, you know, have a wholesome, godly relationships with. And, um, and he did that. He did that really quickly. Um, and, you know, I, I, I threw away movies that I had. Um, uh, didn't talk to people that I, I used to hang out with. Um, I worked in, in salons, hair salons, and um, I would actually, you know, there's lots of style magazines and stuff like that. I would actually turn over magazines. I would turn the covers over so I wouldn't have to look at them. Anything that would make a thought, thought pop in my head, you know, I, I did everything I had to do to, to fight Satan, you know, because everywhere I turned, especially when you first get saved, and Satan's going to come at you like gangbusters, you know, and um, so I fought, I fought the battle, and, and, and I was, whenever Satan would come at me, I mean, I would quote scripture, um, and even if it was a scripture that I felt like related to the situation I might be in, that I was trying to battle, I would just, I would say whatever would come to mind. 
And even if nothing would come to mind, you know, it's like, Jesus, just start saying Jesus. Satan hates that. You know, it's the name above all names. It's power in the name of Jesus. Um, so you got to do your part. You know, you can't go out and keep living the lifestyle and expect Jesus to deliver you from it. It's not going to work that way. Um, he was faithful to, to, to take those desires from me. And um, it was six months. I have friends who, it, it took a lot longer than that. Um, but they were also, you know, faithful to him, and he was faithful to them. Um, and so, Jesus is your only way out of that. If you want out of it, he's your only way. Now, to the Christians, who the, the born-again Christians who struggle with gay desires, don't give up. Do not give up. God is faithful to deliver you as well. And you know that. Um, but he's not going to deliver you if you're living the lifestyle. He's not going to deliver if you deliver you if you're dabbling in the lifestyle. You know, you have to be 100% committed to him, 100% surrendered to him and his will for your life and ask him for strength to give you give you strength to resist Satan. Cuz Satan's going to try every trick in the book to get you to fall and to get you to give in. Don't do it. I'm telling you, because if, if, if you if you keep giving in and giving in and giving in, <laughs> you're just going to make things a lot harder on yourself, and you're going to be miserable. Stay obedient to Jesus Christ and what you know is his will for your life. And um, and you're going to see him move, and you're going to see him deliver you, and, 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 and however long it takes, he's building his relationship with you, and he's also building a massive testimony you share with other people and and if you're truly born again and sold out to Jesus Christ you know that so I just want to encourage you you know don't don't give up don't give up and he's gonna deliver you when you least expect it that's what he did for me I didn't know how long it was gonna go on you know I mean in six months might seem like a long time to some people and some people it might seem like a really short time for me, it was, you know, it was, it was forever, you know, it was a hard road. And he delivered me when I least expected it. But the moment that the words were spoken to me, I knew that that was it. It was the end of my struggle. I knew it in my heart, man. I knew it in my heart. It was it. And I was right. Um, and from that, that moment forward, I have not struggled with it. I, I, it's completely gone, you know. Um, been married for almost three years now, and um, I, it, it's, you know, being married is more amazing and incredible than I could ever imagine. Um, now, for those of you who are not saved and who are living a gay lifestyle, um, my guess is that you love your lifestyle. I did. Um, because as unsaved people, we love sin. It's our nature. We're born, everyone is born with a sinful, wicked nature. Um, and, and, but when you become born again, God gives you a new nature, and, and you become a new creation in Christ. And old things pass away, behold, all things become new. Um, and you, you get that new nature, and it's a na nature that's, that's righteous in the sight of God, and it's, and it's clean, and it's acceptable to God. He forgives your sins, and you start with a clean slate, and um, it's incredible. So, anybody who is living the gay lifestyle um, and wants out of it, Jesus is your way out. Absolutely, he's your way out. But you've got to surrender to him. Um, becoming born again is not simply believing in your head that Jesus is, is God and you know that he died for your sins and it's not that it's not just going to church it's not just doing things that um, look religious you know that seem religious being born again is not religious it's not a religion it's not a religious uh, state it's a it's a relationship between you and Jesus Christ and um, if you surrender to him and believe in your heart, 
believe in your believing in your heart is far different from believing in your head. And that's what you have to do, and you have to surrender to him 100% and say, you know, Jesus, you are Lord. You are a master. You are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, you're it. You run the show, not me. I give it up. I surrender to you. And um, when you sincerely do that, the Holy Spirit will come make a home in you. Literally, the Holy Spirit will come to dwell within you. And um, you will be born again. And Jesus will free you from that lifestyle if you let him. And you do the things that you need to do on your end. Now, for those of you who are living a gay lifestyle and you want to stay in that lifestyle, um, you have to know that it is a sin. Just like any sexual immorality is sin. All of it. I speak about homosexuality because that's where I came from. I can speak on it. It's my experience. But it is sin and it is an abomination to God. And if you don't become born again, you will go to hell when you die. It's just that simple. It's that simple. And it's not because you're gay that you're going to go to hell. But it's because you're, 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 you have not been made right with God. You've not accepted the free gift of salvation. You haven't been made born again. And anyone who's not born again, when they die, spends eternity in hell. Um, those of you that are born again, spend eternity with, uh, with God in heaven. Um, so you have to know those things you have to know and understand. Um, nobody likes to hear it, you know, but it's the truth. Hey YouTube, um, many of you have asked me if I am still gay, um, or if I struggle with homosexual tendencies and thoughts and desires and everything else. Um, the answer is no. I am not attracted to women. Um, I do not struggle with, um, the desires or the attractions. Um, I don't, um pursue that lifestyle, I don't engage in that lifestyle, um, and it's a conscious choice to do so. I, um, when I first got saved, I mean, that was the hardest time period for me, was literally just being very conscientious of every thought that came into my head, and sometimes the thoughts would bombard me, and the memories, and the you know, you start thinking about something, and before you know it, you've you've got a whole um, you've got a whole fantasy played out in your head. You've been fantasizing about something for 20 minutes, and you don't even realize that you were doing it. Um, so, in the beginning, the struggle was to not only give my life to the Lord and what I was doing physically, but to also give my heart and my mind. Um, to God because um, I didn't want to I didn't want to feel hypocritical I didn't I wanted my private life to match my public life but I wanted it to be real I didn't want to not engage in the homosexual lifestyle but yet secretly still be attracted to women there was absolutely no peace in that um, and uh and ultimately, that's just no way to that's just no way to live. Um, and I believe that if God didn't make me gay, which I know that He didn't, because in the Bible, His Word, um, He very clearly states that it's not okay with Him that you're engaging in homosexual activity or conduct or lifestyle or any of the above amongst many other things, but the topic of this video is on homosexuality, so don't send me a bunch of messages about drunks, because drunks have their own deal. They should probably stay out of the bar, and since you're struggling with homosexuality, you should stay out of gay town, um, and off porn sites and everything else that, that help you to um, entertain those fantasies. But that's really what it what it started with 
initially. And the Bible is clear. If you don't have a Bible, you need to get a Bible. You need to read a Bible. You need to have a clear understanding as to who God made you, His original design for your life. Um, if He says that it's not okay to be gay, well then, He's going he's gonna to help fix that. He's going to help take away those desires. You have to be obedient, though, in recognizing that that what he said is true, that you're not bo you have not been born gay, um, despite what you're feeling. Uh, feelings are fickle, and they will lead you astray. Um, but you can stand firm on the Word of God. So you need to get a Bible. Um, the Bible says to be transformed daily by the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say in Christ Jesus. I added that part. The reason I added that part is because you can be transformed daily by the renewing of your mind in a number of ways. You know, CNN can transform your mind. Um, TMZ can transform your mind. Uh, anything that you want to engage in can transform your mind. However, if you want your thinking to line up with the thinking of God, then you need to understand what the Bible says. So, be transformed daily by the renewing of your mind, and who better than Jesus Christ? The Bible also tells us to take every thought captive, and that's the tricky part. Um, but when I first got saved, I would have a thought, um, or an emotion, or a physical response to something, and I would literally stop, say the name Jesus, sometimes that's all you can get out, <laughs> sometimes that's all you can say, and even then, it's like biting tooth and nail. You don't want to do it because you want to entertain your flesh, you want to do what you want to do, but if you can just say the name of Jesus, that desire, that longing, that crazy feeling in the pit of your stomach that takes over when you know that you're engaging in something you shouldn't be engaging in. Um, say the name Jesus and get out your Bible and start reading what he says about you. Who he's called you to be. Um, the great and wonderful plans that he has for you. Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you did not know. And that's the truth. Um, I, I wish for all of you to live peaceful, joyful lives, um, free of the homosexual stronghold. Um, and there was a time in there that I told uh, a few of my online friends, I've had the pleasure of, of talking to a few of you and um, Skyping with a few of you and everything else, but, you know, there was a season in there that I really felt pretty asexual for a while. Um, in my head, I knew I wasn't supposed to be attracted to women, so I was constantly submitting that to God, but yet I hadn't yet... God had not yet given me any proper, um, healthy attractions towards men either. So, for a while there, I felt much like a neutered dog, you know, just kind of like a eunuch. Um, and I, I mean, I thank God for that time now because it's, it's given me a chance to read the Bible and learn about, um, you know, healthy relationships, healthy sex, sex in its proper perspective, um, and all of those things. So, you know, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, you know, instantaneous. It was pretty instantaneous for me initially, um, you know, first couple of years, but all I did was read the Bible. Literally, that's all I did. I read the Bible. Um, I couldn't listen to the radio. I couldn't even watch television hardly or watch the news. Um, I didn't really have many friends that weren't Christians. And that wasn't to be snotty. And it wasn't to be, um, 
mean or, or rude or an outcast. It's just what I had to do in order um, to really get grounded and rooted into the Word of God um, and to allow the Lord to transform me. Uh, he had to change a lot of things about me. He had to, you know, change um, my mannerisms, things that I thought were funny, um, the way I talked to people, the way I engaged people, um, the way I carried myself, um, you know, even things as small as mannerisms. I mean, once the Lord starts working on you and He starts molding you into who He originally designed you to be, um, it's quite a transformational process and it takes a little time. So, first couple of years, studying the Word of God, you know, um, just like anything, you can take your eyes off the Lord and you can start kind of engaging back in the world from time to time. Um, and I'm guilty of that. Um, the process is to repent and to repent quickly, allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin. Um, or your sinful thoughts or your sinful desires or whatever the case may be to repent quickly and um, to begin to follow the Lord with your you know every waking moment and eventually the struggle becomes less and less um, but I don't believe for a second that God intends for any of you to live uh, with homosexuality the rest of your life. I don't believe it. I believe that we have all been made through Jesus Christ to be healed, to be whole, to have peace, um, and to live all the promises that God has for us. And that does not mean wallowing around in your homosexual wallowings. There's uh, a bright future for all of us. It just may take a little time, but you set your mind to it that it doesn't matter how long it's going to take. It could take 20 years, 30 years, or the rest of my life, but ultimately you're serving God um, because you love Him, because He's given you life, because He's given you um, air in your lungs and flowers to smell and the sky is blue. Um, I'm not being sarcastic. I really like all those things. So... Um, I don't know if any of this helped anybody. If you have questions, um, then please keep on sending the questions. Um, in the meantime, I wish you all the best, and I pray for um, every one of you who uh, are struggling, looking for help, um, but your help is in Jesus. Your help is in um, believing that what he said is true and moving forward in that and um, and you will walk in victory no longer struggling with this and and uh, having a hard time and I know what it feels like to have your mind wrapped around something so much that you don't feel like you can do anything else and that's not a good place to be so, until then, have a good day. Bye. If you've ever asked the question, what must I do to be saved, then you have something in common with someone mentioned in the book of Acts in the Bible. The Philippian jailer is mentioned in Acts chapter 16 and asks that very same question to two of his prisoners, the Apostle Paul and one of Paul's partners in the ministry named Silas. They answered the jailer with a very direct statement, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Believe in the Lord Jesus. To make sure that we understand the answer given by Paul and Silas, let's first examine exactly what it means to be saved according to the Bible. To understand how to be saved, a person first needs to understand why he needs to be saved and what he needs to be saved from. The Bible teaches that all people are sinners who have broken God's laws. All people have rebelled against God and justly deserve death and punishment for their sins. The reason why we need to be saved is because we have sinned against God, a God who is good, holy, and a God that loves us. Many people would say that we need to be saved from our sin. And while that's true, there's something much greater and more frightening that we need to be saved from, and that is the just wrath of God against sinners. 
1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 states that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Many people are uncomfortable with the idea of God's wrath, but the Bible is clear. God is not only a God of love, but He is a God also of justice. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is He. His justice demands that He punish sinners. Think of it this way. Let's suppose that a man committed the crime of rape. He came before the judge and said to the judge, Your Honor, I admit, I did rape that woman, but I'm sorry. There are many other women with whom I have interacted in my life, and I have treated them with respect, and have even gone out of my way to help many of them. Surely, since I have treated all those other women well, you could let me go. I know that you are a good judge and a loving judge. Therefore, I ask that you dismiss my case, since you are so good and loving. If that judge were to let that man go unpunished, we would rightly be outraged. We would cry out for that judge to be fired. Because the judge is loving and a good judge, he must punish that rapist. And it's the same way with God. Proverbs 17 verse 15 states that he who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. That's a very important idea about God that even the ancient philosophers like Socrates knew quite well. They knew that a perfect God would also mean perfect justice, which means that he cannot simply let sin, any sin, go unpunished if he was in fact a perfect judge. God must punish sinners because he is loving and just. If you love something, you must hate that which hurts it. If you love people, for example, you must hate murder. If you love children, you hate pedophilia. In fact, the more that you love them, the more you will hate that which sins against them. God is rightly angry at sinners. Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. God's just wrath against sinners is taught all throughout the scripture. God's word says in John 3 verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. In Ephesians 2 verse 3, Paul states that the unsaved are children of wrath. Romans 1 verse 18 states, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And Romans 2 says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. These are only a few of the scriptures that indicate that the unsaved will face God's holy wrath on the day of judgment. So, keeping in mind Proverbs 17.15, how can we, as sinners who justly deserve God's wrath, be forgiven our sins if it would be evil for God to justify the wicked? The only way was for a perfect, sinless substitute to be punished in our place. That is, the wrath of God for our sins needs to be satisfied. That's called propitiation. 1 John 4 verse 10 says, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. So God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, to be born a human. He lived a sinless life and perfectly fulfilled the will of the Father. That means that Jesus was the only person in history that deserved to go to heaven. He could have demanded that they open up the gates for Him because He had earned the right to enter. When he was on the cross, it was not the nails or the beatings or the crown of thorns that saved us. It was that when he was on the cross, the full weight of all your sin was put on him, and God poured out his just and righteous cup of wrath on him for our sake. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What that means is that Christ traded places with us. He took our place for the sins that we have committed, past, 
present, and future. And the second part of that verse says that he did so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in exchange, he gives us his perfect record to be judged with. So on judgment day, we will not appeal to our lives, but to his perfect life with no sin. It is his righteousness that we boast in. All sin must be punished. Either your sin will be punished on judgment day with the wrath of God, or it will be punished 2,000 years ago on that cross. The choice is yours. In the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, written hundreds of years before Christ, it prophesied of a Savior that would come to take away the sins of the world in this way. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So how does a person get this forgiveness of sin that is offered freely to all? That brings us back to the answer given to the Philippian jailer by Paul and Silas in Acts 16. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Does this mean that all you have to do is believe in what the Bible says about Jesus and you'll be forgiven for your sin and will be saved from God's wrath? To answer this question, let's examine another verse in the scripture that talks about belief. The Bible says in James 2 verse 19, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Yes, even the demons believe, but they are most certainly not on their way to heaven. Obviously, the word believe is used in two different senses in both of those verses. In James 2.19, the demons believe the facts about Jesus, but they've never repented of their sins or submitted to Jesus as Lord. In Acts 16.31, Paul and Silas must obviously be talking about a deeper level of belief than that of the demons. In fact, if you look up that word in the Greek, it has the connotation of faith and trust as well as intellectual belief. Belief that saves not only involves believing the facts about Jesus as revealed in Scripture, but it also involves repentance of sin. The Scripture is clear on this requirement. Repentance and faith are both necessary for salvation. Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3 and 5, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Mark 1, verses 14 through 15 says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus said in Luke 24, verses 46 through 47, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. In Acts 3, verse 19, Peter, preaching to a crowd of people, says, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. In Acts 20, verses 20 through 21, Paul, speaking about his past ministry, says that he did not shrink from declaring to you, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. These are only a few of the many passages of Scripture in which repentance is mentioned as being necessary for salvation. You may notice that in some cases only repentance is mentioned in relation to salvation. In other cases in Scripture, such as Acts 16 verse 31, only belief or faith is mentioned in relation to salvation. Sometimes the author's intent was to emphasize the faith component of salvation. Sometimes the author's intent was to emphasize the repentance component of salvation. Other times he wanted to emphasize that both repentance and faith are necessary. This is why we must learn to read Scripture as a whole and not just pick out a verse here or there to make our point. Scripture is plain. Repentance and belief are both necessary for salvation. So what is repentance? Repentance is not feeling bad about your sin or feeling regret for your sin. Often it contains a regret for your sin, but it involves a willingness to turn from your sins and a willingness to, at the same time, turn to Christ and have him be your Lord. Repentance comes from a word in the Greek language called metanoia, and it means to change one's mind. That's what it literally means. Meta for change, noia means mind in Greek. You need to change your mind about sin. Does that mean that you need to be perfect before you can come to Christ? Of course not. If that was the case, no one could be saved. 
but you must truly be willing to turn from your sin and change your mind about your sin. And if you truly change your mind about it, it will result in action, even if that action is feeble at first. This repentance also involves a turning towards the Lord, and again, a willingness to make Him your Lord. Jesus says in Matthew 11 verses 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You can truly rest in him and in his forgiveness, and it doesn't matter what you've done. Literally anything you can think of, he can and wants to forgive. But also notice that even though his yoke is easy, a yoke, by the way, is what they used to put on an ox when they would drag a plow. And even though it is easy and it's light, it's still a yoke. He is still the boss. If you follow Jesus, you must be willing to dethrone yourself and enthrone him. So what about you listening to this? Maybe you've never heard any of this before. Maybe you've heard all this before, ever since you were little and you grew up in the church. Have you ever truly repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus, submitting to him as Lord and embracing him for all that the scripture reveals him to be? Romans 10 verse 9 through 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I urge you to get in a quiet place where you won't be disturbed and think about your sin. Think about how you have offended a holy God that loves you. Think about how you have failed to live for him. Then think about what he did for you at the cross. God the Father loved you enough to pour out his just wrath upon his very own Son, who had never done anything wrong. God the Son loved you enough to bear the wrath of his very own Father in your place. God is the author of salvation. We love him because he first loved us. So if you want to be saved, earnestly cry out to him and ask him to save you. Ask him to give you a new heart. Ask him to remove your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 25-27 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. These verses are most likely the background for Jesus' words to Nicodemus in their conversation about being born again in John chapter 3. Being born again means that God has worked in a person's heart and removed their heart of stone and replaced it with the heart of flesh and has caused them to be sensitive to and broken over their sin and has caused them to begin to hate sin that they once loved and caused them to have desire to surrender and to submit to God whom they once ignored and hated. If you repent of your sin and believe the good news, the gospel that God has sent his son to take the punishment for your sins, you will be saved. Your eternal destiny is secure cured and you will be with Christ in heaven when you die and the fear of death and the freedom from the bondage of sin and the peace of the Lord will be yours. The greatest gospel verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5:21. He made him who knew no sin sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me unpack those 15 Greek words. He, God, made Jesus sin. What do you mean he made Jesus sin? Only in one sense. He treated him as if he had committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, though in fact he committed none of them. Hanging on the cross, he was wholly harmless, undefiled. Hanging on the cross, he was a spotless lamb. He was never for a split second a sinner. He is holy God on the cross. But God is treating him, I'll put it more practically, as if he lived my life. God punished Jesus for my sin, turns right around and treats me as if I lived his life. That's the great doctrine of substitution, and on that doctrine turned the whole reformation of the church. That is the heart of the gospel. And what you get is complete forgiveness, covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When he looks at the cross, he sees you. When he looks at you, he sees Christ.
I know that there are people watching this video and in this room who are not trusting Jesus Christ and therefore can only expect condemnation. And so I'm just going to plead with you. Lay down that rebellion. Lay it down. And simply embrace the gospel that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the righteous one, died for your sins. He was raised on the third day, triumphant over all his enemies. He reigns until he puts all of his enemies under his feet. Forgiveness of sins and a right standing with God comes freely through Him alone, by faith alone. See? 